My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The process of transition from communism to capitalism in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, in the Balkans, and now in China, Cuba, and potentially North Korea, this process was largely hijacked either by outright criminals in budding outfits of organized crime, or by pernicious and all-pervasive kleptocracies, politicians and political parties bent on looting the state and suppressing the opposition, sometimes fatally. In the first 16 years of transition from communism to capitalism in Europe, industrial production in the economies in transition tumbled in real terms by more than 60%. The monthly salary in the poorer bits equaled the daily wage of a skilled German industrial worker, or one-seventh of the European Union's average. Gross domestic product per capita is still less than one-third of the European Union's. Infrastructure, internal and export markets, state institutions, everything crumbled with dizzying speed. In some countries, not least Russia, Privatization amounted to a mass transfer of assets to cronies and insiders, often well-connected members of the communist nomenclature, managers, members of the security services, and other penumbral figures. Laws were passed and institutions tweaked to reflect the special interest of these shadowy groupings. Classical forms of crime flourished throughout the benighted region before, prostitution, gambling, drugs, smuggling, kidnapping, organ trafficking, and other varieties of delinquency yielded to their perpetrators billions of dollars annually. In the impoverished economies of the East, these fantastic revenues, laundered through offshore accounts, were leveraged by criminals to garner political favors, to buy into legitimate businesses, and to infiltrate civil society deeply. None of this is new to Western publics. Rogues and robber barons have always doubled as entrepreneurs, for instance, in the United States. The oil, the gaming, the railway industries in America, for instance, owe their existence to dubious personas and questionable practices, to use uh, the century's understatement. Well into the 17th century, the British sovereign maintained a monopoly on chartering businesses and awarded the coveted licenses to lawyers, servants, and obsequious psychophants. Privateers were licensed by the king to act as pirates, for instance. Still, the ubiquity of crime in East Europe and its reach are unprecedented in European annals and potentially world history. In the void-like interregnum between centrally planned and free market economies, only criminals, politicians, managers and employees of the security services were positioned to benefit from the upheaval. At the outset of transition, the underworld constituted an embryonic private sector, replete with international networks of contacts, cross-border experience, capital agglomeration and wealth formation, sources of venture or risk capital, an entrepreneurial spirit, and a diversified portfolio of investments and revenue-generating assets. Criminals were used to private sector, were very used to private sector practices. They understood price signals. They knew about competition, cutthroat competition sometimes. They did a lot of joint venturing, and third-party dispute settlement. Crime, alone among all economic activities in communist societies, obeyed the laws of the free market. Criminals had to be entrepreneurial and profitable to survive. Their instincts sharpened by often lethal competition, and they were never corrupted by central planning. Deprived of access to state largesse, criminals invested their own capital in efficiently run small to medium-sized enterprises. Attuned to the needs and wishes of their customers, criminals engaged in primitive forms of market research through neighborhood and grassroots pollsters and activists, namely drug pushers. Criminals responded with agility and in real time to changes in the patterns of supply and demand by altering their product mix and their pricing. Criminals have always been pioneers of bleeding-edge technologies, pun intended. 
To this very day, criminals are effective organizers and managers. Criminals excel at enforcing workplace discipline with irresistible incentives and irreversible disincentives. They are good at setting targets and at networking. The superior felonious echelons are upwardly mobile and have a clear career path. Every management fad, from territorially exclusive franchises to stock options, every such fad has been invented by criminals long before they were accepted in boardrooms. In East Europe, criminals on all levels, from the organized to the petty, often substituted for the dysfunctional or ideologically hidebound organs of the state. Consider the dispensation of justice, for instance. The criminal code of conduct and court system replaced the compromised and lethargic official judiciary in many countries. Debt collectors and enforcers stood in, stood in for venal and incompetent police forces. Crime is a growth industry. It sustains hordes of professionals, accountants, lawyers, forgers, cross-border uh, guards and guides, weapons experts, bankers, merchants, hitmen, you name it. Expertise, know-how and acumen amassed over centuries of practice are taught in the criminal universities known as penitentiaries. Roads less traveled, countries more lenient, passports to be bought, sold or forged, how-to manuals, goods and services on offer and demand, hands-on training. It's all there. Profit margins in crime are outlandish and lead to feverish wealth accumulation. The banking system is used both to stash the proceeds and to launder them effectively. Tax havens, offshore financial institutions and money couriers, they all form part of a global web. Thus cleansed and rendered untraceable, the money, the proceeds of crime, is invested in legitimate activities. In some countries, especially on the drug path or the trail of white slavery, crime is a major engine, actually, of economic growth. As opposed to the visible sectors of the East's demonetized economies, criminal enterprises never run out of liquidity and thus are always keen to invest. Moreover, crime is international and cosmopolitan. It is accustomed to sophisticated export-import transactions. Many criminals, as opposed to the vast majority of their countrymen, are polyglot, well-traveled, aware of world prices, the international financial system, and demand and supply in various localities and markets. Criminals are experienced negotiators. In short, criminals are well-heeled international businessmen, well-connected both abroad and with the various indigenous elites. The Wild East in Europe is often compared to the Wild West in America a century or so ago. The Russian oligarchs, goes the soothing analogy, are local versions of Morgan, Rockefeller, Pullman and Vanderbilt. But this superficial affinity is spurious, is wrong. The United States always had a civic culture with civic values and an aspiration to ultimately create a harmonious and benevolent civic society. Criminality was regarded as a shameful stepping stone, an aberration on the way to an orderly community of learned, civilized, law-abiding citizens, at least in theory. This was the ideal. But this cannot be said about Russia, for instance. The criminal in Russia is, if anything, admired and emulated. Crime is the ideal. Even the language of legal business in countries in transition is suffused with underworld parlance and jargon and slang. There is no, and never was, a civic tradition in the countries of Eastern Europe. There's no Bill of Rights, or a veritable constitution, a modicum of self-rule, the rule of law, true abolition of classes and nomenclatures. None of this. These territories, in East Europe, Central Europe, the Balkans, are accustomed to being governed by paranoiac and murderous tyrants um, akin to the current crop of, of delinquents. That some criminals are members of the new political, financial and industrial elites and vice versa tends to support this long-rooted association. In all the countries of the region, 
politicians and managers abuse the state and its simulacrum institutions in close symbiosis with felons, delinquents, and criminals. Patronage and sinecures extend to collaborating um, uh, lawbreakers. Veritable villains gain access to state-owned assets and resources in a cycle of money laundering, which benefits everyone involved. Law enforcement agencies and the courts are encouraged to turn a blind eye or even to help criminals eliminate internal and external competition in their turf. In turn, criminals serve as the long and anonymous arm of politicians, obtaining for them illicit goods or providing black op services. Corruption often flows through criminal channels or via the mediation and conduit of delinquents. Within the shared sphere and space of the informal economy, assets are shifted among these economic players, politicians and criminals. Both types of players oppose attempts at real reform and transparency, and they encourage, even engender, nationalism and racism, paranoias and grievances to recruit soldiers. Foot soldiers and mercenaries. Fortunately, there is still this irrepressible urge to become legitimate, if only for the next generation, the criminal's children. Politicians who grope for new ideological cover for their opportunism partner with legitimacy-seeking, established crime laws. Both groups benefit from swelling economic pie. They fight against other, less successful criminals who wish to persist in their old ways, and thus hamper economic growth. The battle is never won, but at least it succeeds to firmly drive crime where it belongs, underground. And this is the future of Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and the Balkans. It may take a year, it may take ten, it may take a century, but that's the way it's going.